I'd now like to welcome a very special uh, panel uh, onto the stage, including what I hope will be a live link across the uh, Atlantic uh, in, in a few minutes. First, the founder and head of Mazdur Kisan Shakti Sangatan, and a prominent leader in the right to information movement in her native India, Aruna Roy. The founder of the... The founder of the Mo Ibrahim Foundation and a senior advisor on the independent reporting mechanism of the OGP, Mr. Mo Ibrahim. <laughs> and uh, we're delighted to have as well the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs, the Right Honourable William Haig. And uh, as I say, I th hopefully we'll be joined uh, in a few minutes with uh, a live link uh, to uh, Washington. Um, I'd like to start off asking you first, Foreign Secretary. I mean, Britain has been very uh, vocal. We're hearing from the Prime Minister this morning in the first plenary session, not just on terms of the commitments to the open uh, government uh, issue, but also particularly on the question of transparency across the board, mm -hmm. but transparency in particular as well on extractive industries. Why? Why has Britain decided to get so firmly behind OGP and, and why the emphasis on transparency? Well, uh, let's highlight two main reasons. Many of you heard from the, the Prime Minister earlier. It's really part of our foreign policy and our economic policy. And, and we believe, and I and my colleagues believe, these things should be connected. This may be a, been a novel idea to some governments here in the past, but foreign policy and economic policy should support each other. And our, our economic policy very much requires transparency. After when you think, where is the growth going to come from in the world? Is it going to come from government spending? Well, not in European economies, including Britain anymore. Is it going to come from consumer confidence? Well, consumers aren't very confident after the recent uh, recession and financial crisis. Um, it's going to come from trade and investment mm. in the world. And trade and investment is supported by transparency. Um, uh, when you think that it's estimated 5% of global GDP is lost to corruption, nobody really knows, of course, but it's estimated that. And when you think that the loss of income to developing countries from illicit financial flows and tax evasion uh, and, and uh, moves of that kind is meant to be something like a trillion dollars a year, you know, that's the same as the GDP of Belgium, Switzerland, and South Africa all put together. These are enormous That's sums. Amazing. Um, well, then you realize that um, having greater transparency is a big part of encouraging trade and investment. So in, in our G8 presidency, that the prime minister has particularly pushed this in extractive industries uh, and in land transactions. Uh, we, we've created a, uh, helped to create agreements with uh, key developing countries in these areas. But it's also part of foreign policy. It's economic policy. It's foreign policy as well. If, if you look at most of the political, dramatic political change happening in the world, it's driven to some degree by a demand for accountability, uh, which is what these two excellent speakers were just mm, talking absolutely. about. Um, uh, the causes of the Arab Spring are very complex, but they include uh, a large measure of demand for accountability. And so if we're going to be moving with the grain of world affairs in foreign policy, we should be on the side of accountability in well-established democracies as well as new democracies. So when you add these things together, we think in the British government, that this is why we say transparency is uh, an idea whose time has come, and we're, we're trying to fulfill that in our domestic policies as well. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to say uh, that we uh, are now joined by the Honorable John F. Kerry, the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, in a live link to Washington. It's good to have you, uh, Secretary of State. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm glad to be with you. Thank you very much. Um, we were just beginning with um, uh, William Hague talking about the commitment to OGP on behalf of the British government. Could you tell us in terms of your own reflections on why OGP is so, is so important in initiative? Sure, no, I'd be happy to, but let me just begin by saying hello to William and uh, what a pleasure it is to be with him and with all of you. And I want him to know that he persuaded me. I was sitting here listening to him and it sounded great. Uh, I, do you want me just to share some thoughts with you? Yeah, there you on. go, William. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, first of all, let me just start by saying that I, I, there are about 20 reasons why I wish 
I could be there with you in London right now, and those are all of my meetings here today. Uh, but uh, obviously, I'm not. I'm glad we're represented there at the meeting. But I just want to start by thanking uh, Foreign Secretary Haig uh, for uh, the British government's tremendous leadership uh, on this front. I mean, really, between the G8 and in the U.S. process on the post-2015 uh, development agenda, as well as in the open government uh, partnership. Uh, our friends in Great Britain have really been extraordinary leaders on this. And so from the President on down, including uh, Ambassador Power at the UN and National Security Advisor Susan Rice, myself, we are deeply committed to the mission of the OGP. And for us, I, I think, much as William was describing to everybody a moment ago, uh, you know, the, the reasons for our support ought to be and embrace of, of everything that this stands for ought to be self-evident. Uh, it's very hard to overstate the impact that civil society has had on our structure of government and who we are and what we do. Uh, the fact is that uh, in the United States, in Great Britain, and in, in countries like ours, people have the freedom to assemble, the freedom to speak out, the freedom to uh, organize, to call for government change. Uh, and, and in our countries, both of our countries, the media holds extraordinary power and extraordinary freedom and ability to be able to shape thinking. And people, individual people through their uh, own individual organiz organizing efforts or through the non-governmental organizations that they choose to become part of all have this uh, freedom to be able to shape the media and to have an impact uh, through the media. So, uh, you know, here in our country, I will tell you, and it's something I grew up with starting in my early years in college uh, and even before when President Kennedy was elected in 1960, his first political event I took part in, uh, I've watched these forces shape our lives. We had the civil rights movement in, in the 1960s when we were all students. Uh, we had the women's rights movement that, that struck out for women's equality uh, and has really transformed our nation. Uh, we had the labor movement. Uh, almost every single movement towards progress, the peace movement, all of these uh, have had a profound impact, and they've all been grassroots, homegrown, because we have this ability uh, to throw our ideas on the table. And I think, you know, I spent a couple of years when I came back from being uh, involved in the war in Vietnam, I spent a couple of years organizing and working to end the war. And one of the lessons that came out to me uh, through that was, therefore, how important it is for government to be accountable. That was a period of time when government regrettably lied to the people it represented. And those lies saw us involved in a war that was uh, wrongful and, and, and inappropriate. So um, I also took part in the first ever Earth Day uh, here in, uh, in the United States, and I was an organizer in Massachusetts at the grassroots level. And we had 20 million people come out of their homes free to make their feelings heard, and they had a profound impact on our country because after the 1970 movement that brought those 20 people, million people out, they didn't stop there. They translated that into political activity that targeted the worst votes in Congress and organized to defeat them, and they did defeat seven of the 12 so-called dirty dozen worst votes on the environment. And that ignited a, a, a legislative response that produced the Clean Air Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Coastal Zone Management Act, and actually created the Environmental Protection Agency that we have in the United States today that is busy trying to deal with climate change and other pressing issues. So the bottom line is, is very simple. The, you know, uh, those of us who came out of that period, Vice President Biden, myself, and others, believe very strongly that uh, this kind of effort, this, the civil society effort, is what creates a farm system 
for future leadership. And you can see it with Lech Walesa, you can see it with Vaclav Havel, you can see it even with Barack Obama, President of the United States, who was himself a community organizer, uh, you know, at the beginning of his uh, public engagement. So, look, we think that uh, it's a remarkable achievement that in the two years since the OGP was founded, the initial list of eight participating countries has now grown to include more than 60 countries, and from Brazil to Turkey to Liberia, more and more countries are passing laws that are guaranteeing citizens the right to information. And, and at the State Department, we are using our ongoing strategic dialogue with civil society to bring new ideas to the table. And we have a new office of faith-based community initiatives. And, and that's a direct result of an idea that came out of that dialogue. And, and so, uh, you know, our hope is that through this work of the OGP, we, we can all maximize this notion that we live in this globalized, interconnected world. And, and President Obama issued a challenge at the UN recently to commit to spending the next 12 months working together to make concrete progress in these areas. So I don't want to go on and on. I know you want to have a little more of a dialogue here. Yeah. But I just want to emphasize how committed we are to this. Uh, we all, as President Obama said, you know, as other countries back down, we have a responsibility to step up. And we need to do it together. And I think that's what's important. Thank you very much indeed, Secretary of State, for your time. I know you're very busy, but we uh, uh, enjoyed uh, having your input uh, here and raised some very important points. I'd like to go to Aruna Roy next, because as John Kerry was mentioning there, the importance of civil society groups working at a, at, a, at a grassroots level is incredibly important. That's what you do in rural India. There is the perception somehow that in places like rural India, the whole idea of open government is not important. Is that the case? Um, well, we've had a lot of humor to begin with this, uh, this evening. So I'd like to say that when we went to a civil service institution, some colleagues of mine and I, and we were presented as civil society members, many of them were deeply upset. And they said, do you think we are uncivil? <laughs> so I think civil society itself has to be unpacked. And the people who live in rural India are intelligent people. Like Urmo said, ordinary people are intelligent. They are bright. We don't listen to them. And we have Gandhi. Gandhi traveled the whole of India, listened to people. And mm -hmm. that's how the national movement for independence really originated. And civil disobedience or listening to human beings whom we dismiss as ordinary is part of the Indian culture. So Indian rural India which really suffers the worst of the worst of Indian democracy is where democracy is most alive. Mm. That's where they want to set it right. They don't want, they do protest, they do struggle, and those photographs we saw on the screen are of course typical photographs, but it doesn't end there. They protest to create something, to make something, to make, they don't want uh, violence, they don't want to beat up somebody. But they do want their bread. They do want their health services. So it was through that, this kind of protest that the Right to Information campaign was actually born. And we do think that their voices were really very strong. And they created the kind of discomfort that's necessary that we talked about this morning. There was a lot of discomfort. There were many people who thought it was terrible. But the dialogue began, which has ended here in a sense. Mm. So the dialogue began between people, the civil servants, and the politicians. And it's in that dialogue, through the course of that dialogue, and the dialectic, where there was protest and advocacy, that a concept of a free, transparent, working environment grew. Uh, just very quickly, to you first, uh, William, and then also, if you'd like, uh, uh, Secretary of State, how important, because one of the themes of OGP is about supporting or creating the space for civil society groups to, to, to function, because it is you know, under threat. You look all around the world, whether it's freedom of expression, freedom of the media, um, how important mm. is that? For, you go first, William, and then if you'd like to comment afterwards, Secretary of State. Well, it is. Uh, it's hugely important, and I think that means um, it matters a great deal what example we set in our own countries. After all, we cannot change everything that happens in other countries in the world, but we can set a good example ourselves 
Uh, we've learned to do that in, uh, here in the UK with, with our own open government action plan. I think, I, uh, and uh, my colleague Francis Maud you know, has done the most fantastic job in pursuing this whole agenda nationally and internationally. Um, but the, the first time we did an open government action plan, I think civil society told us we hadn't included civil society in it. Um, quite forcefully, actually, <laughs> uh, I think. And so uh, the second time we did it, they are included very much um, part of the plan and part of the input into it. So it's very, very important in a country like ours, an extraordinarily free and open country. Um, and I think if we set that example, and we do so in other European countries and in America, well, then it leaves fewer excuses for other people in the world where it is it can be even more important. Secretary of State? Well, I agree, but I mean, the simple reality is that, that in, a dem in a democracy, and particularly with the vibrancy of the social media today, uh, you really have to be open. I mean, it seems to me we're seeing a new accountability in a lot of places. What happened in Tahrir Square, uh, the pace at which information moves and events unfold is, is different from ever before. I heard a story the other day, I was in Asia at the uh, Asian summit, and one of the uh, stories going around there was about how in one country, I'll leave it unnamed, but in one country an official uh, was caught in the social media with, with a sort of you know, white spot where his tan line was on his watch. <laughs> and so there was no watch, but somebody realized he'd been wearing one. So they went back and found some pictures and they found him with a different watch almost every day of the week, much more expensive than he could afford on his government salary. And boom, uh, they found as a result uh, corruption and, and he lost his job, among other things. But so there's a new policeman on the block, very different from the past. And, and that is this broad accountability from the people. But, you know, before that even existed, one of the fundamentals of our of our notions of how you govern is you got to listen to people. And the White House uh, has recently developed a, a new means of trying to tap into this, which is an online uh, petition platform called We the People. And just in the last two years, more than 10 million users have generated more than 260,000 petitions on topics ranging from gun violence to Un, you know, how you un unlock a cell phone. Uh, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And, and one of the virtues of this, I think William will agree with me, is those of us in government in positions like I have, we, we come and we go. I, I'm here if I don't screw up for another few years. But uh, there are a lot of groups out there that have a lifetime expertise built up advocating for the environment or for children or for one thing or another. And, and we need that input because they will have much better information in many cases and a more grassroots, people-based view than somebody who may come in and out of government and, and, and the whole purpose is really is to listen to people and build on that experience. So it's invaluable, absolutely invaluable. We, we like your honesty, Secretary of State. I wish I could tease out the name of the country that, uh, of the story you were saying earlier. <coughs> well, I think if you Google it, you'll find it pretty fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, come to uh, Mo uh, Ibrahim, uh, if I may. And Mo, you and the Mo Ibrahim Foundation have been very uh, involved at looking at uh, good governance and exceptional leadership in, uh, in Africa, well known for your work uh, uh, and, the, and the work of the foundation on that. I want to talk about two things, business and the importance of, of, of business and business leadership in this whole issue of OGP, and particularly in terms of transparency. And what does the Open Government Partnership need to do in order to continue raising the bar in terms of commitments and on towards or sustaining its progress? Right, that's uh, two tough two questions. Two big questions, yes. I know. Right. And, um, I'm really amazed by the absence of the business people uh, from our, our group here. Uh, business have a stake in open government. It's important for the business. And business also coming under extreme pressure from civil society now uh, to really to clean up their act. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have seen so many uh, uh, really sad uh, incidents. Uh, 
every day I open the newspaper, the bank has been fined a billion dollars, you know, somebody been, it, it's really tough what's going on there. So it's time for business to show us really that they are good citizens. Mm -hmm. And that is something important to business to be here. There's, not, there's no business people really uh, joining our, they are part of civil society. And uh, open government is important for the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really need uh, to, to uh, uh, invite the business people. It's not like uh, they should be invited, you should you know, knock at the door actually. That's uh, as far as uh, business. As far as commitments, mm. uh, it's too early yet. We only had two years now. Uh, we managed to produce the first reports on the uh, first eight countries. Uh, I'm concerned about a number of things. First, for the credibility of this body, we need to produce really credible reports, country reports. And uh, to produce country reports, we'll have to hire research teams in each country to produce really the reporting on each country commitment. Uh, that's if we are serious about this. That that's the money. independent reporting mechanism. That's the independent reporting of, of the yes of the uh, 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 of the partnership. That needs money, needs funding, and I'm very concerned about the state of the funding. The last time I looked at our account was a few days ago. I found something very strange. Uh, civil society, uh, actually four uh, foundations, funded over four million dollars. Sixty governments funded 1.6 million dollars. And I turn to Secretary of State there. I'm not going to include you there because Britain done very well. You done half of this one, but you are okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but United States, I mean, contributed only two hundred thousand dollars. This compared with, I mean, eight hundred thousand dollars, six hundred thousand dollars from UK. I mean, UK has got three times the GDP of United States. I mean, we know we there is some. When <laughs> <laughs> we know there have been issues with the Congress and the budget, but I think you got some budget now, and you saved the ticket. You didn't come here today to the meeting, <laughs> so it's have the ticket, you know. So you really need that. Well, that, might, that might get you an additional 5,000. <laughs> because seriousness. I don't think that's, that's gonna, I don't think that's quite gonna meet the demand by ticket. But, <laughs> <laughs> but let, let, me, let me announce something, if you will, because we're very engaged in many, many parts of the world. I'm very proud. Uh, you know, we may not give to every single entity that asks, but we're giving literally hundreds of millions of dollars in these kinds of efforts. And I'm proud to say that no country in the world is putting as much money into developmental issues uh, as we are every single year. So I, I, I don't feel defensive about it, but I am happy to tell you today that the United States, uh, we're announcing right here at this moment that we're putting uh, $2.5 million into a pilot anti-corruption project in West Africa. And it's designed to facilitate collaboration between governments and others. So uh, I think we're, we are prepared to put money up. And I'll have to check into why the ODP is getting more. I'll find out. Yeah. And actually, I <laughs> <laughs> and it, really, in fairness, I, I I sing it out to the United States because I had the uh, secretary here, and I love him. I'm a fan of him. <laughs> but the, the, really, the truth has, you know, we have, we have to be frank. Friends have to be frank with each other. But many governments really did not cough up. And this, this is not a free right. And it's unfair for civil society to bear the brunt of this and governments to have a free right. So commitment <coughs> means commitment. And we need really to see that in order for us to produce really credible reports and to really go forward. So that's a big challenge for us, actually. Okay, thank you very much. I wish we could go on and on, actually, but I know that uh, William's uh, got a very tight deadline. Secretary of State, thank you very much indeed for joining us and giving us your, your, your time. With you. Much appreciated. So I just want to ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. Wait one second, we've got one more, one more question from Aruna. Secretary I, State. I just have a question which I want to ask both of you. The world has become a much better place. There's more transparency in governments. There's more accountability. But at the same time, 
There are more restrictive laws being passed by all governments today than ever before. And there is an attempt at surveillance by my government and your governments. Why is this happening? I want to know. Because if we are going to become an open society, we should always trust each other. And we don't have to spy or suspect or believe that the other one's bad. I trust you. Well, I trust you. I believe that there is a social contract between the two of you and all of us that we will work in the interests of each other. It's such a delicate balance that when it gets disrupted, that it takes a lot of time to set it right. I'm not being critical negatively, but I really want the world to be a better place. And we've been building this trust. We call talk of trust deficits. We've been building it with so much care. Me with my government, all my friends here with their governments, we want it to prosper. John, that's one for you, then. <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't me, that was William. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, William, does that mean that you guys uh, have never, or do never, no, I'm not going to. Uh, can I? Can I just say to you, <clears throat> uh, look, I'll just answer you very quickly and I'll answer you very directly. Uh, there is no question that the President and I and others in government <clears throat> have actually learned of some things that have been happening in many ways on an automatic pilot because the technology is there and the ability has been there over the course of a long period of time, uh, really going back to World War II and to the very difficult years of the, of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. And then, of course, 9-11, uh, the attack on the United States and the rise of radical extremism in the world uh, that is hell-bent, determined to try to kill people and blow people up and attack governments. Not just us, but Tokyo subway, London train station, Madrid, I mean, many, many parts of the world have been subject to these terrorist attacks. And in response to them, uh, the United States and others came together, others, I, I emphasize to you, and, and realized that we're dealing in a new world where people are willing to blow themselves up. I mean, walk into a building where trucks are willing to be filled with fertilizer and planted outside a building and blow it up no matter who's in it. And there are countless examples of this. Look at, look at Nairobi the other day, where Al-Shabaab goes into the Westgate Mall and kills, uh, you know, dozens, almost 100, more than 100, more than 100 people innocently killed doing their shopping. So what if you were able to intercept that and stop it before it happens? We have actually prevented airplanes from going down buildings from being blown up and people from being assassinated because we've been able to learn ahead of time of the plans. I assure you, innocent people are not being abused in this process, but there's an effort to try to gather information. And yes, in some cases, it has reached uh, too far inappropriately. And the president, our president, is determined to try to clarify and make clear for people and is now doing a thorough review in order that nobody will have a sense of abuse. But I want to, I want to assure you that the basic go I mean, just the other day there was, there was news in the papers of 70 million people being listened to. No, they weren't. It didn't happen. There's an enormous amount of exaggeration and misreporting in some of what is out there. Uh, you know, what we're trying to do is in a random way find ways of trying to uh, learn if, in fact, there is a threat that we need to respond to. And in some cases, I acknowledge to you, as has the President, uh, some of these actions have reached too far, and we are going to make sure that that does not happen in the future. Thank you. Secretary, thank you very much indeed for your time. I uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you also to Foreign Secretary William Hague and to Aruna Roy and to Mo Ibrahim. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you.